What's going on everybody? Sam Hatch, Culture Dog, back here with the third video in this kind of brief down and dirty series on Laserdisc audio. And on, in the last video I talked about how to listen to Dolby Pro Logic, you know, Dolby Surround. That's one of the things that makes it awkward is Pro Logic is the decoding hardware that you're going to see on your receiver and Dolby Surround is going to be listed on the back of your jacket on your Laserdisc. Uh, hopefully if they did things right and they may even have a little bit more information about a matrix surround uh, track on there um, to give you a little bit of a heads up as to what's going on there but things changed hugely in 19 well originally in 1992 in cinemas when Dolby Stereo Digital dropped with Batman Returns in June of that year and that brought digital discrete 5.1 surround sound audio to theaters and then there was a big push to get that into the home video arena as well so laserdisc was the prime benefactor in very early 1995 dolby digital titles started dropping quickly so I, yeah i mentioned dolby digital ac3 there were a ton of different names for this format but basically all it was was just digital audio and it was five channels and then a 0.1 channel for low frequency effects. So um, the five channels were full bandwidth. So, you know, from the, the, the lowest of the low to the highest of the highs in your left, right, and center, and stereo surrounds. So whereas ProLogic Surround had a, a bandwidth limited surround, and it was just mono, uh, these were stereo and, like, full. So you could have, say, like a big tower speaker, and if you had the room for it and maybe a projector and... You could have five identical tower speakers around you and they would all be getting full channels just like your old stereo channels were like that quality and then the subwoofer would obviously get a, a bandwidth limited just low frequency effects um, channel because it's just yeah under a certain amount of hertz because there's no need for all that other information so that's why they called it a point one because it's not a a full channel per se and then depending on your receiver if you had smaller speakers all around you, you could also then add the bass that those speakers couldn't reproduce and add that on top of the LFE effects channel and, and dump that all on the subwoofer or multiple subwoofers, depending on how you had it hooked up. So it was a big deal. And DTS, Sony's SDDS, and Dolby Digital were the competitors, and it was really heating up. The marketplace um there was a big format war going on in the theaters it seems rather silly now especially because you know there's no reason one had to be the winner but you know you know how these mindsets go especially in terms of uh, video and audio formats like there must be a victor and um yeah so it was heating up hardcore so laserdisc was prime territory for adding 5.1 surround sound to its movies so they dropped, you know, Clear and Present Danger, um, yeah, True Lies, uh, Stargate was an early one, the Interview with the Vampire. There was a lot of stuff dropping uh, quickly. And I was picking them all up and I didn't have AC3 because not only did you need a player that had a special AC3 RF output, so no player before 1995 could play these tracks. Um, they could only play the the stereo digital tracks and the one leftover <laughs> analog audio track. Um, so yeah, it was there was also a war going on in home video in terms of how 5.1 was going to be implemented on this format. Um, and yeah, over here in the states, we had the benefit of having multiple audio tracks on one disc, whereas you know overseas PAL discs had one or the other. But here we could have full CD quality stereo tracks in digital form on a disc and also have the old school analog audio and have like the CX uh, noise reduction added to it. And, and so there was two relatively quality options available for you. AC3 was pretty genius in that it decided to backdoor its way into the discs that everybody was buying up left and right. LaserDips was taking off. 93 94 were big years for the format really big years and i mean not in terms of vhs numbers etc but in terms of the biggest in laserdisc history 
So it was really shaping up to be a thing. And AC3 was smart and used a little bit higher bandwidth than what they were already using in theaters. In theaters, they, they cleverly, interestingly, uh, they added the little digital information. They look like almost little QR codes in between the film sprockets. And that's how they added it. Whereas DTS would have separate CDs that you would have to sync with the film with a time code and do it that way. Um, so yeah, Dolby Digital was very compact and, uh, and dynamic. It had just one pool of bits you know, 384 kilobits per second for Laserdisc. And it wasn't split evenly among all the different tracks. It was dynamic based on the need of each individual speaker. So if the surrounds were quiet and there was nothing going on, then the mains could get all of the bits split amongst them. Uh, so it was only in moments when all the speakers were driven at the same time that that you know that 384 would be divided evenly but most of the time you know it, it would be steered towards whatever speaker needed it so it sounded worse on paper especially if we're like ah oh, 384 kilobits per second divided by you know 5.1 uh, that's next to nothing but in you know in actuality when you were listening to it it was it was a lot more impressive and it didn't sound like that crappy old you know mp3 sound with like weird glitches and warbles and stuff like that um everyone was expecting it to sound like boiled ass and it surprised everyone including the the stalwarts at widescreen review magazine etc um so yeah so they took one of the one of those analog tracks so you have stereo digital tracks stereo analog tracks their their idea was that analog audio didn't mean as much in 1995 as it did back in the day most people weren't rocking old pre-1984 players and they were like well we'll go ahead and throw them a bone if we just take one of those analog tracks and stick the ac3 digital audio in there because uh, it doesn't need that much space because it's so compressed uh, we could keep the other analog audio track and people could listen to it in mono so you know the assumption that if you're playing this old 1982 you know, laser disc player, you're probably not rocking like the most modern, hippest surround sound setup anyway. So mono audio might just do you fine. Um, DTS took that as, you know, a, a kind of talking point to be outraged because their idea was that you needed to have that analog audio to be fully backwards compatible with all the older players. And uh, so they decided to steal the, the PCM digital audio tracks and get rid of those entirely. Um, so yeah, Dolby Digital ended up being the smarter way to go because it didn't really change the discs that were already coming out. They just snuck a little little bonus treat in there for you. And if you used it, great. If you didn't use it, you didn't really notice it because most people were using newer digital era players anyways. And they were just going about their business as usual, listening to those PCM audio tracks and they still sounded freaking awesome. You know, I was rocking True Lies. It sounded fantastic. I was rocking Clear and Present Danger. I was rock, rocking all that stuff, and it sounded amazing. And it was only probably 99 when I first got Dolby Digital for the first time. But the big faltering point at Dolby Digital was you couldn't plug the back of your, you know, laser disc player directly into a receiver that was capable. Um, and there was a transition period, much like with ProLogic, where you had to buy an add-on you know, a little decoder unit with a bunch of analog outputs on the back that would then be connected to a receiver, you know, amplifier that had multiple analog inputs. And then there was also some that had everything integrated together. Uh, there are a handful of really cool um, old audio video uh, products, receivers and processors, etc., that can take Laserdisc AC3 RF directly. Um, you know, that stopped being a thing after a time, and there's a, a, a very, very small handful of them that also have onboard DTS decoding. There's a pretty nice uh, Pioneer Elite AVR that my buddy Sean has that has you know, built in AC3 RF demodulating and decoding and DTS decoding all built in. So there were those options, but for the most part, what you needed was a box in between your Dolby Digital capable equipment and your new Dolby Digital capable laser display. 
So that complicated things greatly. And those demodulators were a little pricey. I got mine for about a hundred bucks. Um, and they've, they've never depreciated in value. And now they're still a sought after and can, they pretty much start at around 80 bucks and beyond. There's a bunch of different ones that do so many more things. Some will pass through all sorts of different audio things and work as a, as an audio hub. And some are more just like mine. They're just pump it in and pump it out. Um, so yeah, so that radio frequency signal that's coming out of the back of your laser displayer through a special output needs to go to an AC3 RFN. And like I said, there are a handful, well, more than a handful, but a very limited amount of receivers and pre-pros from a certain period of time that have those. So mo in most cases, you needed to find the AC3 RFN on a demodulator box. And once you had that, it would sort out the signal, find the digital AC3 track, and then pump that out in it's you know it's native form that a receiver and even modern receivers can understand so if you go and buy an adobe digital capable receiver chances are it's going to play fine with the adobe digital signal sent out of that rf demodulator um, but that's the biggest kind of hurdle in terms of collecting and playing back ac3 discs uh, finding them is easy it's great because so many discs had ac3 audio on them um, and a lot of times, you know, films that were released back in the 80s were reissued in the 90s with AC3, like Dune and, you know, Beetlejuice, etc. So, uh, and they don't really go for a ton of money. Uh, so it's a really nice way to get a lot of cool films in 5.1 surround sound. And unlike with DTS, there's not that much of a premium on them, except some of the later releases. So yes, um, you're going to need some different equipment. Uh, and like I said, some of the players have it all. Some of the players have the AC3 RF out. They've got the optical out. They've got coaxial digital out. They've got analog outputs, etc. cetera. Um, those players are your Swiss army knives and there's a, there's a decent amount of them. Um, there were services specifically MSB was big on supplying the service for like 350 bucks where you could add on AC3 outputs to just any old player. And you could still do that today. Uh, there's a guy named Benedictus, if I remember correctly, in Germany, uh, who sells the boards. You can also make the board yourself if you want to. I know there's been some industrious uh, Laserdisc fans who have done such a thing. And um, you can add AC3 even to the oldest of old players, etc. Uh, there was a cool guy in the Laserdisc uh, Forever forum, uh, Ingo Ba, we used to call him. I don't, I don't know if that was his real name or not. Uh, but he would add AC3 to these old pioneer players. It was great. Um, so yeah, you could, and it, it requires a little bit of soldering and a little bit of know-how, but um, yeah, there's there's guides on how to do it, etc. So that part's doable. Uh, you can make your player AC3 compatible and, and you know not bust the bank with it. It's a lot cheaper to get that board for like a hundred bucks or whatever, and maybe a couple parts and stuff uh, than it was to send it, send it out to MSB and have them do it, ship it there and ship it back and hope it didn't get destroyed in the process. Yeah, that was... That was pretty pricey. Um, but that said, being in the future, like we are, it's pretty nice because there are a ton of AC3 decks out there. Pioneer put that uh, RF out in a lot of players. And they even put them in, I just mentioned, like kind of mid-grade players, like the D504 and the D505. They took away the digital outs. You could still obviously listen to, you know, the analog outs and, and have digital stereo tracks decoded inside the player. It still sounded great. Um, but yeah, the fact that I had you know, AC3 on those players was pretty darn cool. Uh, the D703 did not have AC3, so the D704 um, is, a, is a prime player. I think the D604 also has you know, the full Swiss Army knife, um, you know, the CLD59. A lot of the elite players, you know, obviously the CLD99 has everything you need on the back of it. Uh, the CLD97 came out just a little too early, so if you want AC3, you're going to have to modify that player. Um, some of the boutique players like Macintosh who took that and kind of fixed it up a little bit, added that on there as a bonus. Um, Panasonic players, most of them aren't AC3 compatible. Uh, so when Runco made their version of the Panasonic LX900, they added AC3 to it. Denon also did it. Um, but yeah, Sony, it's also tough. There's only 
like Japanese only branded players that seem to have AC3 outputs on Sony players. Most of the Sony players you'll find are from the 80s and early 90s. So you're going to want to find Pioneer players from 1995 and beyond. And thankfully, there are a lot of them. Um, but yeah, if you have like an older CLD S201, something like that, it's not going to have AC3 RFM. So check for that little thing. It's going to be on the back of your player. It's going to be clearly labeled AC3 RFM. And finding the discs uh, that are compatible with it are a little trickier. They would definitely have big hype stickers on the jacket, a cellophane, uh, but on the jackets themselves, sometimes that information is absent completely. And then sometimes, as I mentioned before, it's labeled as Dolby Digital. Sometimes it's just AC3. Um, it gets a little confusing. So you might want to befriend the LDDB, the LaserDisc database. Uh, they also have a list of AC3 discs there. So it's pretty cool. So yes, yeah, so you need a player made after 1995 that has an AC3 RF out. You need a you know, a connector, a 75 ohm, just RCA style jack connector to go to either A, a receiver that has an AC3 RFN. The amount of people that see digital in on the back of a receiver and think they could plug it directly into the laser displayer, um, there, there's sheer countless numbers of them. Uh, and if it does not say AC3 RF, you are screwed. If it says Dolby Digital in, it's probably for Dolby Digital from a DVD player look for AC3 RFN or like AC3 LD, anything like that. There is a listing out there of all the available products or all the known available products that have built into modulators into them. Um, yeah, that said, it's, it's more practical to have a newer receiver that can do all of the modern things, everything you want, and then to find a demodulator. So that's the key thing, finding an RF demodulator. Uh, there, there's they're all pretty much the same. You know, they, a lot of them reuse the same chips, um, but there are some, you know, of varying um, pedigree. Uh, Pioneer's got a pretty badass one that's that's tough to find. Um, but, you know, I found a Sony Mod RF1. I've used it for years. It works fine. It always locks onto the signal strong and steady. It's just you turn it on, and, like, when it senses AC3, it just, boom, slams on the signal. No muss, no fuss changing sides there's no kind of like weird signal loss or it doesn't like lose lock um i haven't had any dropout problems with it there was some instances where discs like stargate uh had some some severe dropout problems so there were there were some hiccups along the way uh there were films that were released on ld like forrest gump that were heralded as these big 5.1 releases when the film was purposefully mixed to have very limited almost to no extent uh of surround activity um <laughs> so that was a bit of a joke and i said there were some errors that was golden eye was released with a, a way too hot lfe track um there's a lot of research to be done as to you know what's cool ac3 sometimes um, Japan would get an AC3 track, like with Eraser, whereas over here in the States, it was just Dolby Surround. Um, yeah, it kind of opens up this whole new world for you. So you're going to have to do a little bit of research in, in order to find the product. But yes, so you need that player, something that can play Dolby Digital, and then you need a demodulator, and maybe also in a receiver. So those three things will be your three, right? Yeah, those three things will be your key to enjoying 5.1 discrete surround sound from Dolby. If you have any more questions, drop them below and I'll be glad to help out. Hopefully this helped you guys. So uh, cheers. We'll be back with DTS.